Good morning. So what is it exactly that we are doing in baptism? Like what's really happening? If you think about it, uh, we do this so often, maybe the words kind of get lost on us. But if you think about it, the things that we say are quite incredible. In just a little bit, I will say, Allison, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit in baptism and marked as Christ's own forever. And that is an amazing thing to say. Do we really have that much power? We are gathered here in this church, and we are going to put water on Allison and smudge a little oil on her head, and we are going to obligate the Holy Spirit to descend upon her and mark her as Christ's own for eternity. That's amazing. But I guess my question to you today is, do you believe in that? Do you believe it? Do you think that what we do matters at all? And does this simple, crazy, and it's just, it's very simple, it's crazy simple act of faith, cause the heavens to move? John came proclaiming a baptism of repentance. Repent, he would say, for the kingdom of heaven is near. And all who went out to see John were hopeful and expectant that God's kingdom was at hand, that they were seeking renewal and amendment of life in order to prepare for it. They would wade knee-deep in the murky waters of the Jordan River to wash away the murkiness of their sins and of living under the occupation of the empire and all of the broken systems of the world. John was causing quite a commotion, and all were beginning to wonder if he could be their deliverer. And John said to them, No, one who is greater than I is coming, and I am unfit even to carry his sandals. So Matthew tells us that Jesus came to the River Jordan, where John was baptizing, a journey of some 70 miles from his home in Galilee, seeking nothing short of John's baptism. Jesus, just like everyone else in the whole countryside, made the pilgrimage and deliberately sought out what John was offering. John protested. This doesn't make any sense. I, was, I just got done saying I'm not even fit to carry your shoes. I need to be baptized by you, and yet you're coming to me? Up to this point in Matthew's Gospel, a few things have been revealed to us about Jesus' identity. He is a Nazarene. He is the Messiah. He is the son of David, the son of Abraham. He is one who is greater than John, who will baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire. And all of these things are drawn up all together in a single, more amplified identity. This is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. This is the first time that Son of God language was used in Matthew's Gospel. And if we were listening to this Gospel or reading it for the very first time, this would be a sudden and somewhat startling revelation that would color your whole reading of the rest of the Gospel. That's exactly what Matthew wants us to do and to experience. I need to be baptized by you, and do you come here to me? Let it be so now, for it is proper to fulfill all righteousness. Righteousness was fulfilled when the Son of God stood knee-deep in the murky humanity he came to inhabit. In Jesus, God is with us in every way. From this point forward in the Gospel, Jesus, the Son of God, the Beloved, is constantly in the company of sinners, rich or poor, young or old, powerful or powerless, admonishing, healing, and forgiving. I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? In all of the scriptures, in all of the scriptures, what happens right here is so very, very important. Pay attention to what is happening in this story very important. 
Yesterday morning, I found myself again at a wall raising of a Habitat for Humanity house to offer a blessing at what was a very, very inconvenient time. I got called on Thursday because the pastor that was scheduled to do that blessing had a a last-minute cancellation. They were in a bind. They needed someone fast, and at first I declined because we had Joe's funeral yesterday at 10 o'clock in the morning. But this house is right down the street on Carroll Street. If you go out on Carroll Street and turn left and get down towards Hospital Street, you'll see it there. This is our neighborhood. This is our neighborhood. And we should be at every wall raising that happens here. Through things like this, God keeps on reminding me that service to the gospel is not a matter of convenience. So I did it. They moved the blessing up about 30 minutes so that I could get back here in time to prepare for the funeral. And so there I am, wading through the mud to climb up and stand on a recently cured foundation my arms full of papers and books because that's how we roll, right? Passing out scripture readings and versicles and responses. We gathered around in a tight circle like penguins trying to take shelter from the wind and the cold because it was windy and cold yesterday morning. And the future homeowners holding the holy bucket as I sprinkled the volu- them and the volunteers and that foundation saying... Let the mighty power of the Holy God be present in this place to banish from it every unclean spirit, every residue of evil, and to make it a secure habitation for those who dwell in it. Why on earth was I out there in the cold, making everyone else just a little colder with drops of holy water, sprinkling that foundation and saying those words? Does it matter? Does it make any difference at all? Could this small cadre of volunteers and and contractors and one priest banish unclean spirits and cleanse every residue of evil? I get the sense when I read the stories in Scripture, I get the sense that we will be appalled, absolutely appalled, at the power that was available to us if we just had the guts to act. When Jesus calmed the storm, he turned to the frightened crew on that boat and said, you have little faith. Why didn't you believe? Or when Peter got out of yet another boat in high seas and took a couple steps on the water before becoming terrified and plunging, After he dried off a little, Jesus said, Why did you doubt? And while it seems perhaps that Peter failed there, there were 11 other people inside the boat that didn't have the guts to jump over the rail. And as far as we know, Peter is the only ordinary human being ever to walk on water, albeit if just for one or two steps. You will not accomplish anything if you do not get out of the boat. I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Let it be so now to fulfill all righteousness. As scandalous as it may seem, as scandalous as it may seem, God has seen fit to call the feeble efforts of the unworthy righteousness. God has seen fit to call the feeble efforts of the unworthy righteousness. John the Baptist consented, and although he was unfit to carry Jesus' stinky shoes, he dipped the bowl in the Jordan, poured the murky water over his head, and the heavens opened, and the Spirit of God descended on him, and a voice from heaven was heard that said, You are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. If that does not inspire you, I don't know what will. You have tremendous power. You have tremendous power to bless, power to curse, power to make peace and to make a difference. 
faith and belief. This is, this is not something that you have to possess internally before you can do anything. It's quite the opposite. Faith is acting against overwhelming odds, believing that it matters. Faith is acting, believing that it matters. Does it matter that we stood in a circle like penguins, reading scripture, waving the aspergillium, and blessing a concrete foundation? Yes, it does. Does it matter that we're pouring water over Allison's head and a little bit of oil to invoke the Holy Spirit? Yes, it absolutely does. When we do these things, we are participating in God's reconciliation of the world to himself because God has seen fit to have us do so in order to fulfill all righteousness. The power, the power and the effectiveness of the sacrament of your ministry does not depend upon your greatness or your worthiness at all. That's the good news. You can pray for someone even if you stutter or if you are shy about using your voice in public. You can pray for someone even if you have no idea what to say. You can act in faithfulness despite what you consider to be your faults. And most importantly, you can share your faith and proclaim the gospel even if you do not feel qualified at all to do so. Nine simple words. Would you like to come to church with me? Have the power to open the heavens. A simple invitation, lending a hand, forgiving someone who has really hurt you, telling your own story. Your act of faith, though seemingly insignificant, may very well cause someone to hear the truth that everyone in the world needs to hear. You are my beloved child, beloved, and with you I am well pleased. Let it be so now to fulfill all righteousness. Amen.